Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, very warm, happy Sabbath to you. Um, good afternoon. I hope that you're all keeping well. Um, and yeah, thank you for the, the program so far. Thanks, Frida, for the singing and MJ um, and Elder Patheus and Elder Marilyn as well. Um, Elder Patheus, you always make me laugh when you call me George. Um, this is a problem that's followed me my whole life, even when I go to school. Um, you know, all the teachers will call me George and I say, no, no, it's, it's Stephen. Um, I guess that's the trouble with having uh, two first names as, you, as, your, as, your, as your whole name. Um, but nonetheless, I just hope you and wish you a very warm, happy Sabbath. Um, and I just want to welcome you again to our Revelation series. Um, so if you were here last week, um, basically for this month in January, we're going to be doing um, a series called Truth Be Told truth be told, and um, we're going to be focusing on the three angels' messages. Um, and for those that maybe aren't familiar with this language, you know, the three angels' messages, um, basically in the middle of the book of Revelation, in chapter 14, uh, there are three angels, and they have three unique messages each. Um, and as Adventists and as Christians, but particularly as Adventists, you know, we feel quite close to these messages because um, we believe these messages to be you know, God's last cry to his final people living where we are in the last days. Um, and so we're going to be exploring these messages. Um, and similar to, to, to how we did last week, um, kind of challenge you. I challenge you to, to view these messages in a different light. They may be uh, heard for you in a way that uh, maybe you're not expecting, you haven't heard before, maybe not the you know, conventional, traditional way. Um, I hope that God will, will really speak and bless us. Um, so I've entitled the message for this afternoon called, um, yes, yes, yeah, sure, sorry, yes. Um, I'll give the title for message and then we'll have the children's story and then I'll carry on with my message. So the title for my message is Don't Defend Babylon. And that's a nice um, trailer for you. Okay, you will watch films for this. is just a trailer for what's going to come. We'll have the children's story and then we'll have the message. So much, Anna, for that. Um, and yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's a really similar theme, man. And thanks for that. And thanks, children, as well. Um, and don't worry, the children's story hasn't ended. We're just going to carry on into an, a little bit of a longer children's story now um, for the message. Um, the title is Don't Defend Babylon. Um, so maybe let's just start with a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much. Uh, for just the amazing, kind God that you are. Thank you for the, the wonderful family that we have here in Norwich. Um, and even though we're so far apart, um, thank you for this you know, device that we're able to, to meet and, and fellowship with each other. Um, Lord, in the Bible it says, um, and you promise us that um, when you send out your word, it will never return to your void. And it will accomplish everything that you need it to do. Um, and so Lord, we cling on to this promise this afternoon. Uh, we're eager to read your word and we're eager to hear what you have in store for us. So Lord, we just ask that you would speak and prepare our hearts to listen as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't defend Babylon. I know um, the title is a little provocative, um, but it will make sense and it's, and it's intentionally provocative as we, as we go. I just want to um, start by sharing um, a picture that I saw. It's a really funny picture. Um, that I saw and I thought um, to share with you. Um, it, it's a man looking out the window and the caption is, me looking outside to see what chapter of Revelation is happening today. And um, yeah, I, I don't know about you, but maybe that's how these last couple of days, months, slash year has felt. You know, the world is just getting crazier and crazier by the minute. And, you know, sometimes you just feel like looking outside just to check, you know, what chapter of Revelation are we in? Um, and whilst it is a joke and it's funny, um, there, is a, there is a fact and there is a, a sentiment that exists in all of us of that. You know, a lot of us have grown up with this worldview and this kind of conception of Revelation. You know, we think it's something to be really afraid of, something to be frightened of. Um, and even when we, when we you know, try to understand the three angels' messages, um, like I said earlier, something that's really quite close to um, the Adventist heart. Um, we, we are like that too, you know. We think it's full of fear and full of doom and gloom and, and something to be scared of. 
But that's not the case at all. You see, as we, as we read through the Bible in the Gospels, the Jesus that we encounter in the Gospels, you know, he's loving, he's caring, he's full of compassion. And the Jesus and the God that we see in Revelation is exactly the same. Now that God hasn't changed, he hasn't changed overnight. He's exactly the same loving, caring, compassionate God. But it's just that this time, the stakes are a little bit higher. The intensity is a little bit more, you know, the tempo is raised, the stakes are a little bit higher. You know, the Bible is the gospel and God has given us the gospel so wonderfully, you know, full of love and truth. And it's the same gospel that we find in Revelation in the three angels' message and even in the second angels' message. And so, similar to last Sabbath, I invite you to join me on this journey and we're going to we're going to journey together to see these messages, the second angel's message in particular, in a new and hopefully a more, a more accurate and a gospel-centered light. Now, that's really the key, putting the gospel and Jesus at the first. So today's title, as I said, is Don't Defend Babylon. Don't Defend Babylon. Just to kind of center ourselves, um, I'm just going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Um, that was read so, so wonderfully for our, um, our children's story, Revelation chapter 14. Um, and today we're going to be looking mainly at verse 8. But I'm just going to start from verse 6, um, just so we have a, a picture of where we are. Um, Revelation 14 verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, same with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and springs of water. And then in verse 8, we're introduced to the second angel's message. And another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This is the second angel's message. Yeah. And, and we're here, we're introduced to this, this saying that maybe we've heard before in our, in our ears of growing up, you know, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And it sounds like a, a condemnation, a, 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 a dooming, impending judgment. But let's just take a closer look at this verse as we're on this journey today. What is Babylon? You know, throughout the book of Revelation, we're introduced to something called symbolism. So the things in Revelation um, are a little bit different to what we see in the Bible. Not everything in Revelation is literal. Oftentimes we have symbols pointing to things. And that's the case that we have here in Revelation. So what really is Babylon? You know, where does this, where does this name Babylon come from? And we see throughout the Old Testament that Babylon is a power that is constantly against God's people, constantly enslaving them, you know, holding them hostage and captive. And, you know, most famously, when we think of Babylon, we remember the story of Daniel and his friends, right, thrown in the lion's den or in the fiery furnace. But you see, Babylon itself goes way back, even before the times of Daniel. And some biblical scholars suggest that it's the same place, Babylon, is the same place where the Tower of Babel took place. That exact land where the, the Tower of Babel took place is Babylon. And hence, because of the Tower, that is where Babylon got its name from. Confusion and disarray. In fact, the Hebrew word that's used here um, for, 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 for the Tower of Babel and, and Babylon is Babel. You know, there's a similar word that's in the middle. So I think for us to really understand what is this second angel's message about Babylon is fallen, is fallen, I think we need to take a look in Genesis chapter 11. Let's take a look at the story of the Tower of Babel and see you know, what are the roots, where is this Babylon system coming from? So you can maybe just keep your finger in Revelation 14 and just turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11. So this is the first book of the Bible and, and this is one of the first stories that we find in the Bible as well. 
Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 9. So it's just a short story. Um, when you're there, maybe you can just wave or let me know. Genesis 11, verse 1 to 9. Okay, cool. I saw a wave from Frida. Okay, cool. Um, let's read. Verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. So they had brick for stone and they had asphalt and mortar. And watch this in verse four, it says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And what does it say? Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that, not, not nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So it's a really fascinating, fascinating story. I mean, this is one of the, the first stories that we have in the Bible. And we see here that the, that the people at the time, they, they, they wanted to make a name for ourselves. It's interesting in verse 4, the reason for them wanting to build this, you know, super high tower, you know, much higher than Big Ben, much higher than the Empire State Building. They wanted to build a tower that goes all the way to the heavens, all the way there. And the reason why they want to do it is because let's make a name for ourselves. They wanted to exalt themselves. You know, this is, this is so self-centered and, and selfish and, 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 and really so opposite to what God is about, you know, what God is about. But it, it's not just that. It's not just that they want to make a name. It's not just that they want to exalt themselves. But Genesis chapter 11 is where we're reading. But what we find in Genesis chapter 7 and 8, so this is just a couple of chapters before, we have the story, does anyone know? We have the story of the flood. We have the story of Noah and the great flood. And now that's interesting, isn't it? Now the story of the flood happened in three chapters and, and three chapters later, people want to make a really, really high tower. See, that's no coincidence, you know. It's not just that they wanted to make a name for themselves, but they wanted to build a tower so that if there is ever another flood and the waters rise and rise, you know, we have a tower to go hide in. A tower that goes all the way up to the heavens where the waters can't touch us. What they're basically saying here is, you know, we can protect ourselves. You know, we can look after ourselves. You know, we can control our own destiny, our own future. We don't, we don't need God to protect us. We can just build a tower ourselves. So this really is one of the first introductions that we have to, to Babel and, and Babylon in the Bible. Now, if you just fast forward me to Daniel chapter 2 and, and chapter 3, and, and we won't read it per se, but Daniel chapter 2, of course, um, you know, the, the Israelites have been taken captive by the Babylonians. And in Daniel chapter 2, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he has this, this, this mighty dream, right? Of all the stat, this huge statue, and he has a head of gold and a chest of silver and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, representing the different kingdoms that were to come. But we find in Daniel chapter 3 that the Hebrew boys are there forced, the whole nation is forced to bow down to an image. And this image only has one metal, gold. So we see here again that same idea of self-exaltation, you know, living for me, protecting myself, self-preservation, this, this idea that it's, it's only about me. I want to lift my own name up. 
I just want to read a, a quick verse in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. And this is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking. He's the, the king of Babylon. In chapter 4, verse 30, it says, The king spoke, saying, Is this not the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? King here is saying, hey, 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 guys, is, is, is this not what I did? You know, everything you see, yeah, 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 that's me. It's all me. So we see here that this is, a, this is, this is inherently what Babylon is about. And this is very, very synonymous. And I, and I perhaps wish we had more time to really, you know, elaborate this. But this is quite synonymous with the idea of, you know, righteousness by works justification by works you know i can do it myself i can get there myself and it and you know what it's all for me it's all about me my power my honor just my honor my majesty and notice in in both these cases with with the tower of babel and also with with with, with daniel in, in babylon that that in these cases god may somehow be intertwined or mixed but god may have some sort of a part in it you know, the Tower of Babel, they wanted to, to rise to reach the heavens. And in, in the statue, you know, it came from the, the vision that God gave. And, that, you know, God was able to give for Daniel to interpret. And we see there was, there was elements of God. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, he worships God on and off. But ultimately, it's about me, me, me. Me, myself, and I. And I'm not here, I'm not going to point fingers, and I'm not going to, you know, call out what these, what these systems now represent in today's world. Perhaps you may be familiar with what these, these false systems may represent. But really, this is the root issue that all these systems, be it, you know, the papacy or the, 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 the apostate Protestantism or, or whatever else we, we, we believe it to be in today's world. The root issue is that it's all founded on me self-exaltation and you know whilst it's important as we speak about babylon in the second angel's message you know whilst it's important that we're aware of these systems that may be endorsing you know a babylonian style of worship some of the systems that i just mentioned earlier whilst it's important to be aware of that it's much deeper than that it's so much deeper than just being aware of what's happening you know um it's, it's always so much easier to you know look out there right to just look up there and 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 and, and, and talk about you know, the peoples and the systems over there you know it's so much easier to do that but today i want to challenge you and invite you to do the hard part the hardest part and that's to look within you know it's so much easier to look out there but I want to challenge you today to look within. You know, Babylon is not just a papacy, apostate Protestantism problem. It's not just simply that problem, but it's a human problem. It's a very human problem. You know, I believe that if left to ourselves, if completely left by our, by our own guys, you know, if there was, there was no Bible, no God, if we, if we were free to do anything we wanted to do, I think Babylon is the reality of what could happen. Babylon is the reality of what we would do. You know, self-exaltation, you know, this false picture of God. And I know it sounds a little bit uncomfortable, um, and I would apologize for that, but I'm not going to apologize for that because, because, because that's what the Bible is saying. And so it's important for us to look within, to challenge ourselves. Babylon is not just those false systems of worship, but it's, it's a human problem, a human issue. So turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It's a fascinating verse. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And incidentally, actually, the book of Jeremiah, he's here and he's, Kind of narrating the fall of Jerusalem. 
the destruction and the fall of Jerusalem under, well, you can guess, under the Babylonian army. And it's interesting that here in the, in the middle of his book, as he's narrating this fall and, and he speaks of God's judgment against, you know, the infidelity of his people, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't you find that interesting that in the, in the middle of this book of Jeremiah, where he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem under Babylon, he says, the heart is deceitful and wicked. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? Babylon is deceitful. Babylon is full of lies. Babylon is desperately wicked. But so too at times is our heart. And I propose that um, the challenge today and the challenge for all of us, as uncomfortable as it is, it's not just you versus Babylon. And maybe that's the idea that we've grown up with here. It's me against Babylon. But I want to challenge and propose to you today that it's more importantly than you versus Babylon. It's you versus you. It's you versus you. You know, we may be happy that, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not part of Babylon. You know, I go to the Adventist church, you know, I'm part of the, the right system of worship. You know, I'm not part of these other church systems, but, but could some part of Babylon be in us? In, in perhaps our relationships, our attitudes, the, the way we live? Is it there in the, in the choices that we make day to day? You know, the way in which we live, the choices we make, the decisions that we, that we make every single day, might that be defending Babylon? Might that be in defense of Babylon? And so I urge you today, don't defend Babylon. Don't defend Babylon. Just turn back with me to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. Hopefully you had your finger there. Um, Revelation 14, verse 8, the cry has gone out from this angel. The cry is, Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. And incidentally, the Greek words that's been used in here for the word fallen is a person, a person. They're two words. And what these words, and it's interesting, you can see here in the English as well, is that it's written in the past tense. It's something that we call the prophetic aorist. It's something that's written in the past tense, even though it hasn't happened yet. And the reason why it's done that is because the author and, and, and the author of the, of the book and the angel is so sure, it's so certain that this is going to happen, that they're confident enough to write it as a past event, as something that's already happened, something that's already happened. And so the cry today has gone out, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So I urge you today, don't defend Babylon, the way we live, the choices we make, the decisions that we do. You know, every single year we remember that the guns of World War I stopped seizing fire. You know, they stopped firing at 11 a.m. on 11th of November, 1918. And this is an important day in all of our calendars because uh, you know, this, is, this was the day that the, the, the World War I ended. And you can almost just imagine the relief, that the carnage, the, the, the hostility, the, the, the pain of the war was finally ended. Well, at least in, in the victorious countries. And, and, and the armistice, it was agreed at 5 a.m. in the morning. It's, it's 11th November, 5 a.m. it was agreed. But it only really came into effect around 11 a.m. And that's why usually particularly I know here in Britain, if you're at school, sometimes we have a minute silence. And often in the, in the capital city, there is, a, there is a service and a parade done to, to honor the lives of those who fought and died for us. And, and this news on the 11th of November, 1918, it was conveyed across the entirety of Europe, across the whole Europe, basically within the hour. So within that hour, everyone in Europe knew, yep, the war's done, we can stop fighting. But the message 
didn't reach East Africa as quickly as it did Western Europe. Remember, this is a world war. People are fighting from all across the globe. Now, and for four years, the British, the Indian troops, and the South Africans, the Belgians, the Portuguese, the others, they had been there in East Africa. And they were trying to capture this person called Major General Paul Van Von Letta Warbeck. And um, yeah, I apologize, I'm not, I'm not a German individual, so I, I, I can't quite pronounce that properly. But, but he was the German commander of 14,000 men. So you have all these nations, they're fighting against this commander in East Africa. And usually a telegram that was sent, you know, that's the way they would talk then, you know, a, a telegram sent from, from Europe to Africa would take usually maybe a day, you know, a couple of hours or, or maybe a whole entire day to arrive. But because his troops were just so spread apart and the message was so difficult to get out because, well, of course, in the middle of the war, on the 12th of November, those two sides went to battle again. Now, can you just imagine this? The whole entire world in Europe, they've stopped fighting. The war is over. But the next day, the message hasn't come to these guys. So on the 12th of November, they go and fight again. They clashed again. And it was only after this, that one letter book, he, he realized that the war has ended. So after, with the instructions, finally, you know, they got out to him. He finally surrendered his troops on the 25th of November. 14 days, two weeks after the war had ended. I wonder, could we too be like that at times? No. The Bible here says in the, in the prophetic hours, in the past tense, that Babylon is fallen. It's done for. It's, it's finished. But could we too at times be defending Babylon, a system that's already fallen and already defeated? But you see, it's not just that Babylon is wrong and deceitful and, and full of lies, but Babylon is harmful to us. It hurts us. You know, in the end, it may, it may seem you know, better at first and it may seem easier off, but ultimately, in the end, it just hurts us. You know, throughout the Old Testament, we see so many cases of Babylon being this cruel and vicious empire, you know, torturing and enslaving God's people. And I, know, and I won't read all the verses for lack of time, but in Habakkuk chapter 1, you have a pretty good summary of what Babylon is about, full of violence and shame and oppression and injustice. So friends, when the cry goes out in Revelation 14 verse 8, that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, this is fantastic news. This is, this is good news. This is amazing news. Why? Because it means the end of those things too. It means the end of violence, of pain, of suffering, of torture, injustice. It means the end of those things too. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This wine that is being talked about here is symbolic of, again, the false doctrines and the lies with which they have deceived so many people, it says all nations, all nations. It's so sad when you think about it, but the cry has gone out that Babylon is fallen. It will fall. And so too will the pain, the torture, the injustice. That too will fall too. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and 5, we kind of have a, a zoomed in, version of, of what it means of this fall of Babylon and chronologically this, 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 this event takes place a, a little bit after usually after the rejection of the three angels messages and I'm just going to read Revelation chapter 18 as it, as it um, again speaks of Babylon it says after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with glory and verse 2 it says Revelation 18 verse 2 and he cried mightily with a loud voice Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. See, we have that again in the past tense. And has become a dwelling place of demons 
a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. The kings of earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of the luxury. And then verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice coming from heaven. Amen. We should all say amen there. Another voice coming from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and receive her plagues. There's another voice coming in heaven saying to come out of her. Come out. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, yeah, you're right. You know, I don't want to defend Babylon anymore. And, and yeah, you know, I, I, I feel the spirit of God saying, yeah. I, I want to come out of her. But you may be sitting there asking the question, how? How? I've been in Babylon for too long. I've got too many ties there. I've got too many affiliations. I've been there so long. It's, it's not quite as easy for me to just come out. You know, how can I come out? I want to suggest to you today, in closing, as we're closing here, that only the gospel... Only the gospel can release and heal us from the ties and the ropes and the chains of Babylon. It's only the gospel. The same gospel that you read in the, the beginning of the New Testament, Jesus, compassionate, caring, kind. That same gospel is the only gospel, the only thing that can release us from the chains of Babylon. But what is this gospel message? What is it? You know, is it, is it Jesus going around and healing people? Is it, is it the first four books of the New Testament? You know, you know what do you mean? What, what is this gospel? I want to introduce to you a, a quote by one of my favorite Christian authors. Um, and the quote is this. It's a, it's a fantastic quote taken from SDA Bible Commentary, um, volume seven, and it's um, page 458. She says this, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. There, hanging on the tree, Jesus was the gospel. He's the personification of the gospel. The gospel isn't just a, a thought or an idea or a philosophy or a thing that you know people in suits and ties say every Saturday to make themselves feel good about each other. No, no, no. The gospel is a person. And there he was hanging upon the cross. It's Jesus. He is the gospel. And she carries on by saying, now this is our message. This is our argument, our doctrine, our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the sorrowing, the hope for every believer. It's Jesus. It's him. He, he, is, he is the gospel. It's, it's him. And in the end, it really boils down to that decision. It's one choice. Everything else might be going around the world and, and you, know, you can read into the signs and the times and all, and all those things. But in the end, it boils down to one decision. And it's a battle for you. It's for your heart. It's, it's for you. And the decision is eternal Babylon, eternal gospel of fallen Babylon. You see, um, as we read at the beginning, the first angel's message and the second and the third, these aren't messages that are in isolation. You know, in reality, this is just one message in three parts. And we see in the first angel's message, it says, another angel flying in the midst of heaven. This is Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, having the everlasting gospel. That's the first angel's message. But in the second angel's message, we see here, it says Babylon is fallen, it's fallen. See, the first angel's message, it's about something that's everlasting. But the second angel's message is about something that isn't. I hope you can see, you know, there's this, there's this juxtaposition, there's this contrast, there's this, there's, this, there's this, you know, there's this contrast between something that's eternal, that has no beginning and end, that's everlasting, against something that rises, but then falls. 
and willful. The gospel is juxtaposed with Babylon and the gospel will not collapse. It won't fall like Babylon will. And so if the gospel is so embedded into our identity, if, if Jesus, who is the gospel, is, is such a part of us that he's actually living in us and abiding in us and, and, and we in him, you know, we too, like the gospel, can live forever and ever. But by contrast, if, if it's Babylon that we defend, it's Babylon that's a, a part of us, unfortunately, we too will fall with this failed system. The gospel message, it's, it's, so, it's so powerful. It's, it's so strong. It's, it's so beautiful that it will bring down everything that is contrary to it. I'm going to say that one more time. You know, the gospel is so powerful, so strong, so beautiful that it will bring down everything contrary to it. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. So don't defend it. Let it fall. If it's fallen, just let it fall. Don't defend it any longer. And in its place, once it's fallen, paint acts of justice, of kindness and and of love that that can only come from God. Today, God is inviting you and me to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his gospel message, a, a kingdom that's eternal and everlasting. So don't defend Babylon. Let it fall and be a part of God's kingdom. Amen. Amen.